Last week, we did many activities on the presidency of James Monroe. I just want to take a few minutes and do some review because it has been a long few days since Friday. The first topic I want to talk about is Henry Clay and his American system. If you remember, Henry Clay was a huge spokesperson for the West. He believed that the federal government should play a more active role in the promotion of America's growth. He also wanted to create a more stable economy for this ever-growing United States. So he came up with the plan known as the American system, which had three parts. And to remember these three parts, you can remember BITE, B-I-T. The B is for bank. He proposed the second national bank. Remember, under the presidency of Washington, Alexander Hamilton was a huge supporter of the first national bank. And so he, he kind of helped it pass through Congress. But remember, Thomas Jefferson was against it. He was a huge opponent of it. So when he became president and through the presidency of Madison, the first national bank faded away and it really hurt the economy. So in 1816, Congress voted to pass a bill that would create a new bank. And this bank was larger than even the first one. It had 3.5 times more capital. That is money. 3.5 times more money, capital, than the first bank. The second aspect of the American system is internal improvements. This is the building of new roads, canals, bridges, internal improvements within the United States. This failed. This is the only part of his system that never came to be. And the reason why is some argued that it wasn't the federal government's right to make these improvements, that it was a state right. And others argued against it because they were afraid that these new improvements would mean that more people would move west from the north and the south. So this never passed. Congress could never get the internal improvements passed. The last, the T, is the Tariff of 1860. Now, the purpose of this tariff was protection of the U.S. manufacturing from British. The reason that this tariff was needed, needed that, is that after 1812, the British kind of flooded the U.S. with cheap goods often below the cost of new American products. So to protect the American industries, they instituted this new tariff that raised to taxes on the British goods and made American goods actually cheaper than British. This was the first protective tariff in the United States. Also during the presidency of James Monroe, we had two really crucial Supreme Court cases. Both of these strengthened the federal, federal government's power. So we have McCulloch versus Maryland in 1819. This was the issue. Maryland tried to destroy its branch of the Bank of the United States by taxing its notes. So the state of Maryland was taxing the U.S. bank. So they took it to the Supreme Court, and the decision was made that the Bank of the United States was constitutional under the Necessary and Proper Clause. 
Remember we talked about it. It's kind of that little loophole in the Constitution that Congress has the power to do anything that's necessary and proper. And then we have Gibbons versus Ogden of 1824. And this was the issue. We had on one side the state of New York who tried to grant a monopoly of river com commerce between New York and New Jersey to a private company owned by Ogden. So only Ogden could control river trade between New York and New Jersey. The issue was that Gibbons had congressional approval to conduct business on the same river. So now we have two sides, New York and Ogden, Congress and Gibbons. Here's the decision. Marshall and the rest of the justices said that only Congress had the right to regulate interstate commerce. So if you have trade between two states, only Congress, the federal government, has the power to regulate that type of trade. Both decisions completely strengthened the power of the federal government. Both of these decisions were also loose interpretations of the Constitution. So let's talk about the three most impactful events of James Monroe's presidency. The three that you have to know. The, the first one is the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And remember the map that you did it in class over the week. So it was actually proposed by Henry Clay. He's back. And in the Missouri Compromise, Missouri entered the United States as a slave state. Maine entered the United States as a free state. It kept a balance of 12 free states and 12 slave states. And this balance held true for 15 years. Also, the Missouri Compromise, remember this line, 3630, the latitude line of 3630, all New states north of that line were to be free. All new states below the line would be slavery states. This compromise lasted 15 years until we found an imbalance when new states started to enter as people moved west. But un until then, it it kept the peace between the two regions. Also during Monroe's presidency. So we have an issue. If you look at Florida, at this point, it's controlled and owned by Spain. What we had was Indians, runaway slaves, and white outcasts who lived in Florida. They escaped to Florida. They would cross back into the United States, attack white settlements, in Georgia, and then retreat back. And they would keep doing this. So Monroe ordered Andrew Jackson to attack and pers pursue them into Spain. So Andrew Jackson came here, and they, as they were running away, he just kept going into Spain. And so the United States gave Spain two options. Either you control your outlaws, which they could not do. They were fighting in many other areas in Central and South America, they did not have the manpower to control. Are you seed Florida? You give it to the United States. So here's the treaty. The adams onis Treaty of 1821. Spain agreed to give the United States Florida in exchange for $5 million. So the United States added Florida to its territory. And the last big takeaway of James Monroe's presidency is the Monroe Doctrine of 1823. And this doctrine lasted nearly 100 years until it was broken. Um, so it was written by John Quincy Adams. Now, if you go back to the adams onis Treaty, that's John Quincy Adams as well. And remember his name. 
because he will be our next president after Monroe. So the Monroe Doctrine was actually written by John Quincy Adams, but it was given by James Monroe in front of Congress. And so this is what it declared. It, it had three points. Number one, it declared that the U.S. would not interfere in the affairs of European nations or existing colonies of European nations. So if, and it's really focusing on the Western Hemisphere, the Americas, that if European had colonies that existed, they would not interfere. But... Monroe warned that European nations should not attempt to regain the control of new independent nations of Latin America. So during this time, many new nations were coming out of Latin America through gaining their independence from countries like Spain, France, and Great Britain. And so the United States said, you will not attempt to regain this land. They are independent and they will stay independent. The U.S. also stated that they would oppose any attempt to reclaim old colonies or build new colonies in the Americas. So Monroe said that they would use military action if Europeans tried to reclaim old colonies or create new colonies in North or South America. Now at this time, America did not have the naval or, or army power to enact or to really do anything about it, but it kept Europeans away. So it, it did its job until the United States had the military power behind it. So those are the three takeaways of Monroe's presidency. We talked about Henry Clay. Now you can move on to your next assignment when we talk about Monroe steps down. And here comes John Quincy Adams as president only after some controversy.